the children of the Oak Walker. Part 5 by Random Appellation 468. In the quiet, dusty interior of the lodge storeroom, Jamie sifted through another round white tube on the shelf filled with surveyor's maps and sneezed. Ugh, this place is worse than the shop. Does Chris really want to start a school in here? I pawed through another thick binder filled with old water testing reports and stifled a choking cough as more clouds of dry particles wafted into my face. No, not this room, thank God. He was hoping for the visitor center. With people crammed in every building we had at the fort, all available storage spaces had been packed with surplus items. This room was no different, its green walls coated in light layers of dust. The chipped hardwood floor, uncarpeted, boxes, ledgers, and map tubes stacked to the ceiling. The park's ecology department, the precursors to the researcher faction, had spent years restoring the land from its ruinous state after the mining company finished with it, meaning there was no end to the maps and charts of the area. Unfortunately, that meant sifting through them to find a nice blend of old and new, as there was no guarantee the landscape would be the same as 30 years ago. We already had a newer one from a few years prior, so now we just had to locate the oldest. All without someone walking in and asking us what we were up to. Ha! Swaying on her wooden stepladder above me, Jamie dragged a map case out of the dusty shelves with a triumphant wave. Got it. Time to run like we stole it. Because we kind of did. As secretive as two Cold War spies, she and I tucked the map case into Jamie's backpack and slipped out the door. Not many people were in the first floor hallways. Most were either at work or already asleep after the night hunt. My own eyelids sagged lower, heavy like lead, but I forced myself to put one foot in front of the other as we jogged up the carpeted stairs to the second floor. Due to our dangerous occupation, rangers got the best accommodations in the former luxury elk lodge, with its brass decor, knotty pine interiors, and soft plush carpets. Each room had its own bathroom and a balcony that overlooked the nearby market and perimeter wall. During the night, the air conditioning would be turned on to cool the building down for sleepers, and in the daytime, it got cut off to conserve power. It tended to stay cool long enough to get some hours in if you had to sleep during the day, but when the temperature rose, it was unbearable. How we were going to heat it come the winter was a popular topic of discussion amongst the maintenance crews, and some work had already begun on old-fashioned fireplaces to burn wood for heat. I could only imagine how much firewood we would be cutting throughout the colder months. Once the door to our cozy room shut safely behind me, I spun the deadbolt and let out a long sigh. <sighs> if I can just get through tomorrow, I'll have two days off. If only I could sleep through them both. Dad, I'll have the time now. Our room was standard for most in the lodge, two beds on either side of the room with desks at their feet, curtains drawn over the glass doorway to our balcony. Soft gray carpet covered the floor, and a familiar dirty hamper greeted me from beside the bathroom doorway on my left. Room 25 had quickly become a second home to me. A sanctuary where Jamie and I played cards, gossiped about various camp news, or cleaned weapons together. Her side was obvious, Messy, with posters on the walls and bottles of gun solvent on the desk. Mine was somewhat more refined, cleaner, with much of the same tidy feel-good decorations as when I'd first arrived, including an orange-scented candle, which I burned sometimes before bed. I hadn't been the one to pick them. Jamie's old roommate had gone missing sometime before my arrival, and it just didn't feel right to rearrange any of it. So I left things as they were. Jamie tossed her bag on the floor, next to her pile of wrinkled socks, and unscrewed the end of the tube to slide the large topographical map from its protective case. This one is still pretty old, but I figure it ought to do. I still have Bill's old survey and stuff from when he worked construction, in case we gotta get laser precise. What's this all about, anyway? I dumped my gear by the foot of my bed and shrugged off my weathered coat, wishing I could take a hot shower and crawl into the covers for several hours. Do you know how to find coordinates on one of those... Looking from her cluttered desk, Jamie narrowed her eyes at me. I mean, kind of. Depends how precise you want me to be. Seriously, what's going on? If I could answer that question, we wouldn't need the map. With tired footfalls, I crossed the room to yank the curtains shut and rubbed at a pulsing in my forehead. I... I need to find something. But I don't have much to go on. Like what? Jamie spread the map out and clicked on her desk lamp. I sat down on the edge of my bed with a wince 
unsure if my sudden headache was guilt-induced or the result of sleep deprivation. I don't know. Jimmy raised one sandy eyebrow, hands poised with a small green lensetic compass over the map. Well, is it big or small? I don't know that either. She straightened up and set the compass down with a sigh of disbelief. So, what do you have to go on, exactly? Trust no one. Ronnie Carter's death rattle echoed in my mind, but I pushed it away to slide one hand under my collar and pulled out the key. Here. Her green irises lit up with curiosity as I pulled the lanyard over my head, walking to Jamie's desk to lay it on the map in front of us. Jamie picked it up and squinted at the odd serrations in the key's teeth. Where did... Carter gave it to me. I folded my arms and kept my voice low in case anyone in the hall stopped by our door. The night of the airstrike. He told me not to tell anyone. So, we're the only two who know about it now. Jamie's slender face took on a stunned frown, and she brushed a stray lock of bleach-blonde hair behind one ear. I don't get it. He arrested you. Why would he... I lied. Now that I let it slip through, the truth overwhelmed me like a tidal wave, and I couldn't stop myself, eyes glued to my feet in humiliation. It wasn't me he was after. It was Chris. The arrest was staged. She tried to give me your old job, but Chris rescued me before I could say anything. Carter gave me the key before he died, but I didn't know who was the spy was, so I couldn't tell the others. And now Chris is head of security, which means if Carter was right, then... Then... My throat clammed up, and I screwed both eyes shut to fight the fear laced tight to my chest. It hurt saying it. it. hurt to think it. And now that I voiced it out loud, I felt like all the strength that had been pulled out of me. I imagined Chris being marched to the firing line, hands bound behind his back, his blue eyes staring at me with sadness. What if they demanded I be one of the ones to pull the trigger? Could I do it? Could I live with myself after? Would I even want to? That's crazy! Jamie shook her head, as if she couldn't believe what she was hearing. Chris isn't a spy. Carter was lying. He had to be. I gripped the edges of her desk to give myself something to lean on, exhaustion and despair weighing me down. But what if he was right? The spy killed two people already, and whoever it is, he still has the beacon. I want to believe Chris is innocent, but I have to have proof. I need to find the person behind all this. What about Sean? ELSAR wants him dead. There's no way it's him. Jamie pointed to the door and moved toward it, as if to leave. He should know. He could help us. No. Darting to the door, I threw myself in between Jamie and the knob and held out my hands to stop her. Even if Sean is above suspicion, he might let it slip to someone who isn't. I can't risk it. Not if the truth is the only way to protect Chris. I won't watch them shoot him, Jamie. I couldn't watch that. At those words, I blinked one too many times and a hot, salty tear trickled down my ashamed face. I'd been holding everything in for so long, and I wanted more than anything to be able to trust one person, just one, with the crushing burden of my secrets. I didn't care that it was breaking Carter's rule. I just didn't want to be alone in this task anymore. Jamie's stare eased into a sad smile, and she pulled me into a rare hug. Hey, come on, don't do that. I believe you, okay? It's just... A lot to process. I knew Carter... He was a rational man, even if he went full dictator towards the end. I also know he was as paranoid as he was persuasive. There's a chance he could have been wrong about Chris. Doing my best to keep from bawling like a baby, I sucked in a shuddery breath in between sniffles. And if he wasn't? I couldn't see her face from the hug, but Jamie's fingers tightened around my shoulders in an almost reflexive twitch. No one's going to shoot him. I promise. She rubbed a gentle hand in between both shoulder blades, and a sensation rippled through me as though a weight had been lifted off my back. Maybe Jamie was right. Maybe soon I could put this whole nightmare to rest and focus instead on working with Chris to build a new schoolroom for the Ford's children. I'd been helping him paint figurines that he cast from scrap plastic and aluminum in the mechanical shop, sorting and packing them so when Christmas came, each child could have something to play with. It would be wonderful to be able to sit across from him at the table in his room and not feel like an imposter. To have nothing more died. Oh, to live so free. Releasing me, Jamie gave my forearm a tender squeeze of reassurance and returned to her desk to examine the key. 
Well, the good news is that Carter wrote the coordinates in standard military 10-digit format. That should put us pretty close, within 10 yards or so of the target area. Of course, if it was anywhere south of the ridge line, there's a good chance it's underwater now. So, let's keep our fingers crossed. She dug through her desk drawer for a clear plastic protractor and a pencil, the two of us leaning over the map with a lamp to guide our progress. I held the key and read the numbers off as she narrowed down our search from the entire map to one quadrant, then to individual squares. Map reading hadn't been my strong suit during the brief training she'd given me when I first arrived, but Jamie was better at it than she put on. Like a treasure hunter from a movie, she went number by number and traced each azimuth with obsessive precision. At last, we both stepped back and Jamie etched a final mark on the dusty paper. X marks a spot. Okay, that's kind of... random. Confused, I stared at the space. A simple blob of green on the complex topographical morass. Is there supposed to be something there? Jamie plucked at the corner of the map where the numbers 0 2 16 19 84 were written. Not from what I can tell. This map was given to us when the mining companies pulled out years ago and turned the land over to us. Obviously, a lot of Barron County has changed since then, but most of the rural areas should still lay the same. Since it's so flat, I'd say it's some kind of gravel pad the miners built to park their heavy equipment on back in the day. Probably an overgrown field by now. Frowning down at the key, I turned the small shard of metal over in my hand. So, you think it's some kind of bulldozer key or something? Her back bent over the small pine desktop. Jamie stenciled a route along various roads with a yellow highlighter. I don't think so. It could be to some kind of machine I've never used, and I'm no expert, so that could be a lot of them. If we want to get a better idea, we'd have to ask Sean or Ethan over at the garage to get a crew out to the side. Except telling them would ruin everything. I tap my foot on the gray carpet, my crude plan still in development inside my head. We'll have to do it without giving them the full picture. The more people who know about this, the higher the chance the spy finds out we have it. We can't do this all on our own. Jamie waved the end of the, her highlighter at me like a magic wand, still focused on the map. We'll have to leave during daylight hours, which means making up an excuse to go through the gates. It's far enough that we'll have to take a vehicle in case we find something to bring back, which means coming up with something to tell the mechanics so we can take a truck or cart. We'll need to bring ammo, food, water, just in case we get stuck out there again. Which means Sean will have to put our convoy on the schedule. And Chris will have to approve it. There's no way to get there without hopping the wall and walking at night. And that's a surefire way to get killed. What about Adam's people? I rested both hands on my war belt, a bout of dizzy fatigue hitting me all at once. We could get them to help us. Then we could ride the deer out to the site. And pretend it was for some religious thing of theirs, without needing to ask for trucks. She clicked the cap back on her highlighter, and Jamie tossed it into her pencil cup. How do we know one of them isn't the spy? I laughed, but she threw me a narrow-eyed glare that bored no humor. They're not perfect, you know. Sure, they're always polite to us, but I've overheard them talking a bunch of different times. They argue just like we do, especially some of the newer couples, and not all of them want to stay here with us. Some want to try and break out of the county altogether, though most just want to stay here forever. Would it be that much of a stretch to assume that one of the goody two-shoes Bible thumpers went over to the dark side in exchange for a free ride to the outside world in a pair of blue jeans? I resented how much that made sense. But at the same time, a part of me didn't want to accept this potential new front in my already complex psychological war. With close to 300 suspects inside the walls of New Wilderness, I didn't need an additional 100 people to add to that list. Especially ones that are hardwired to be more perceptive and intelligent from birth. Folding my arms, I maintained my stubborn idea. Adam and Eve I trust. After all, the spy killed two of their guards, so they wouldn't give information to ELSAR. Not with their baby coming soon. They would help if we asked. You're not listening. Jamie stabbed the map with her forefinger, an incredulous tone to her voice. Do you know where this is? It's in the north, Hannah. I shrugged and felt the tug of the bandage fibers on my cut arm, reminding me I needed to shower and change the wrappings out. So? So? Jamie rested one hip against the desk with a skeptical sigh. 
It's in the wild zone. Neither we nor ELSAR have control there to keep the beasts in check. And some of the biggest mutants roam around like they own the place. Wyverns in particular are a problem. Wyverns? I pretended like I didn't remember that name from my monster identification training, but the hand-drawn illustrations from the book Jamie had shown me floated back into my memory anyway. Huge, bat-like wings, thick scales of bark-like hide, claws sharp enough to punch through a car door. Dark eyes that could see in the dark for hundreds of yards, and the body of an enormous lizard with a full mouth of deadly teeth. Uh-huh. Jamie yawned, her own fatigue showing through the tough demeanor. They're big enough to feed on echo spiders, and they build their nests from scrap, broken trees, or even rubble. They can rip planes out of the sky, if any are stupid enough to fly that low. If we take the deer out there, it'll be like riding a happy meal. Man, I hate when she's right. Staring down at the map, I calculated the distance from the little scale in the lower right-hand corner and weighed my options. Jamie had better instinct than I did on wilderness survival, and she'd never steered me wrong before. However, I couldn't confide too much in the mechanics. Not with their close proximity to the clinic and to the armory, where all sorts of rangers moved in and out. I'd have to be careful which stories I told to whom, so that no one got together and compared notes. So, we borrow a light vehicle. Something unarmored, but still running, so we don't draw too much attention. Picking a spent casing up from her cluttered desk, I placed it on the map like a token in a board game and moved it as I explained. If Andrew will help us without asking too many questions, he could get an excuse from Ethan. With a regular gas-powered car, we could make the trip in a half hour during daylight hours and pass it off as a perimeter check. If we move fast, we can get in and out before anything or anyone even notices that we're there. And what about the spy? Jamie angled her head to throw me a pointed look. You said this would get Chris off the hook, right? How does this flush the traitor out if they don't even know about the key? Confidence mounting, I counted off the words on my fingers as my idea took shape. We don't tell anyone the same thing. Dr. O'Brien knows about the puppet mural, but not the key, right? Right. Jamie unscrewed the cap of her canteen to down some water, her skepticism giving way to a curious grin across her lips. So, we tell Ethan about the key, but not the puppet mural. I jiggle the camera case in my hand for emphasis. Whatever we feed to Ethan, we tell differently with Sean and Chris. That way, the three factions aren't getting the same information. Whoever the spy is, they want to report immediately if they think they have valuable intel. And whatever gets leaked to ELSAR first, lets us know which faction the spy is from. Once we know where to look, all we have to do is play process of elimination. Catching my breath, I waited for Jamie's response, her face a mask of contemplation as she thought over what I'd said. When I'd first arrived, I'd been the quiet, naive one who couldn't lie to save her life. Now, I wanted to construct a lie so big, so complex, that even a trained spy couldn't navigate through it without exposing himself. Like the net trap for the puppets. Heck, even the bait is the same. Me. Except this time... I only have Jamie to bail me out if things go sour. Jamie's mouth stretched into a pleased smile, and she let out a mischievous giggle. <laughs> you know, it's just crazy enough to work. We captured some ELSAR radios a while back, and the researchers were able to hijack their signal. Sometimes our boys can listen in on their radio traffic, depending on who is on the air and when. So, as soon as the spa blabs, we'll definitely know. Somewhat relieved, I jerked my head toward the ceiling, where the third floor rested above our heads. What should I do about Chris? Every part of me hated to ask the question, knowing how much it hurt Jamie. Just seeing the way she looked at him cut me to the soul. I tried not to show too much affection when Jamie was around. She had never once tried to get in the way, carrying on in valiant silence that I never felt I deserved. It both puzzled, infuriated, and worried me that my best friend could be this way and my mind refused to let go of the mental gymnastics I used to pretend it wasn't a real issue. She likes Andrew. I'm sure it's just some residual emotions, nothing more. Jimmy winced, brief pain slicing through her calm expression like a knife, but she pushed it away in the next instant. The less he knows, the better. Decker is a worry ward, and there's no way he'll let us go north if he catches on. For now, just keep him talking about anything else and hopefully we can pull it off before he figures things out. 
Guilt-ridden at how I'd managed to dampen the mood, I'd swab the finger in my eyelids, both of them heavy as lead. Listen, I... I'm sorry about this. I know it's a lot to drop on you all at once, but thanks for sticking with me. She flashed me an appreciative wink, and Jamie grabbed her overnight bag from the corner before heading to the door. I'll talk it over with Andrew tonight, and we'll work on Ethan tomorrow. Until then, you clean up and grab some shut-eye. I doubt Chris will want you falling asleep in your dinner. After she left, I slumped into my desk chair and dangled the key between idle fingers. Jamie trusted my plan, and I was glad to have told her. It didn't seem so insane now that I'd put it into words. Though I still couldn't shake the feeling it would only take one person to screw everything up. That could mean the difference between more people dying or not. And my guts churned at such knowledge. To think I used to complain that Louisville was boring. Glumly, I slid the cord back over my head and began picking at the laces of my crusty boots. Hey guys, Ninja Gaming here, and thank you so much for listening to today's story. If you did enjoy, please feel free to leave a like, as it does help the channel innumerably and does get the gospel into people's feeds, as well as please consider subscribing, as we are trying to hit 10,000 subs by the end of the year, and it would be a massive blessing for the Lord if you guys did so. Of course, if you haven't done so already, million dollar question on screen or now, pin comment and description if you prefer to read it that way, but please do, as it'll be the best decision you make. It'll teach you about going to heaven, teach you about repenting of your sins and trusting in the good Lord Jesus Christ with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then building that relationship with the Lord by reading the Holy Bible daily, praying daily, and evangelizing people. It's great stuff, so please do so. At the very least, please consider doing so. It's not a very long thing, so I, I'd be very much appreciated if you did so. Of course, go give Random Appellation 468 some love in the comments and the description. The original story link and his Reddit page will be down there as well. Go give Muse some love in the comments and the description as well. All of the music and... Uh, his YouTube channel will be down there. My brothers have a YouTube channel to make plush videos, and they make plush videos, um, as by their username, their name of the channel. I make quite a few cameos over there. So if you want to see me in something other than horror stories and gaming, go check it out. Uh, they, they're uploading daily in 2024, which is great stuff. And of course, I recommend the 2021 videos. Those are some of my favorites. And it's really good stuff. So if you guys are interested in that, please go check it out. I'd be very much appreciative. My youngest brother has a... Uh, he wants to be a rapper, and so I am leaving a link to his YouTube channel and his SoundCloud in the description for all of his music. So please go check that out. I'd be very much appreciative as well. Yeah, any sound effects are in the description as well. I don't believe there's any in this one. I know there's not, but yeah, uh, and yeah, as well as the Barron County Anthology playlist by, of course, Random Appalachian 468 is down there a, to the playlist link, or it's on the end cap, as well as one of my other favorite stories, a former stalker texted me this morning, she's been dead for a year, is down there as well. That is by Tiro1000. So those are some of my favorites, so go check them out if you guys want something neat to watch. And I would definitely recommend the Barron County Anthology, especially because this is a continuation story, right? It's still going on. So if you haven't heard the other stories, make sure to go catch up. I've done everything um, from the past. So all the stories... Um, prior to the Children of the Oak Walker, and there are a couple more, there's two more parts up right now, part six and seven of the Children of the Oak Walker, and I will be narrating those as well. It's just going to be a little bit longer. If you want, go check it out, go to his Reddit page, Reddit Ablation 468 and you can read ahead if you want, which would be awesome. All right, y'all, I will talk to y'all later, and I will see you soon. We should, hopefully, hopefully we'll be streaming tonight, it will be GTA 5 if we will, we need to finish it up, getting a little close to that date that I don't like, you know, that's a little close, February 20th, uh, and then it's gone forever, so if you guys care about trophies, or uh, at least want, or have plans to maybe get into trophy hunting, or achievement hunting, regardless, it's for the Xbox One as well, um, not for PC, mind you, if you are like that, and, uh, and at, le at the very least, you just want to make sure that everything that you have is uh, possible still. GTA 5's Rockstar Editor is leaving. So all the trophies associated with that are going to not be possible. Everything's possible, Lord, but of course you guys know what I mean. In um, February 20th. So on the Xbox One, excuse me, on the PS4. PSC is good. So Steam, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if you can get it on anything else, but on Steam, for sure, it is still going to be there, I believe. Um... I read that it was, but if you want to be on the safe side, definitely do it. I don't want to, I'm not trying to spread, spread mission misinformation. So do it if you can, you know, if you want to make sure to get it done, I'd highly recommend doing it. I really should, but you know, 
uh, it's still got to beat the story on uh, Steam because I restarted. So I don't know. But you should really get that done. So definitely get those done if you haven't already, uh, regardless of what it is. I believe PS5 and Xbox Series X is good as well, but same thing. Do them if you can. So, yeah, make sure to do them if you uh, care about trophies and stuff. All right, guys, I'm going to let you go. I love you. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you all, and I'll talk to you all very, very soon. But until next time, guys, this is Ninja Gamer. Signing off.